I drink and I know things. That's what I do. Welcome to Drunk on Dragons, where we drink and we discuss each episode of House of the Dragon. I'm your host, Jamie G. Esquire the Fifth, the Lord of the Wines. And I'm here with Magna Mills to break down the Lord of the Tides. Mills, what is happening, buddy, in the realm? I guess you're not the Prince of Tides. I thought that was one of your titles. I mean, are you not dating Barbara Streisand anymore? I guess we're going to have to catch up. And uh, oh, maybe I'm getting you confused with Steve because he's the Prince of Steaks. Now I'm hungry again. What are oh, we doing? God, I want a cheesesteak yeah, so bad. What are we doing? All right, um, I'm Magna Mills. Thank you for checking out Drunk on Dragons. You can find us wherever you get your pods by searching for Drunk on Dragons. That's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, wherever you get them, we're there. You can find us on the social media at Drunk on Dragons. Same thing, wherever you're on it, we're there too, except the Facebook. We are not on the Facebook. And you can find our YouTube channel at JoeBlowFootballShow.com. If you could, please like, follow, comment, subscribe, that kind of thing. It only takes you a minute. It really helps people find the show. We enjoy talking about this, so we'd really appreciate it. And please be aware that Drunk on Dragons is an amazing podcast and show, but it's also a full spoiler show, okay? So all episodes of House of the Dragon, Game of Thrones, it could and will come up in our discussions. We might occasionally mention the book spoiler, but don't you worry because we're super cool. We're going to go ahead and give you a heads up if something like that is about to go down. And if you didn't know, now you know. And knowing is half the battle. This is The Lord of the Tides, Episode 8 of Season 1 of House of the Dragon, which originally aired Sunday, October 9th, 2022. This was directed by Gita Vasant Patel. This is the first episode of House of the Dragon that she has directed, written by Ellen Shim. This is her first writing credit on House of the Dragon. The short plot synopsis is six years later. With the Driftmark succession suddenly critical, Renera attempts to strike a bargain with Rainey's. And before we get too deep into our cups here, let's give our initial thoughts on the episode. How did this one work for you, man? This was a interesting one because when it was all over it took me a bit to process because i have read fire and blood at least a great portion of it that i kind of knew what was going to happen so it, it felt like not anticlimactic but i don't know but then the kind of the more you thought about it and it really did have that classic thrones feel like the tension was dialed up so high all episode i didn't even really realize it the first time through and then i kind of realized like i was sitting there the whole episode waiting for kind of the next shoe to drop and really like you know again you had Vayman go out and kind of that you know crazy you know uh buzzsaw uh Bertowski there from the running man kind of way except a little bit cleaner and we all kind of knew Viserys was not long for this world so it wasn't like shocking or anything but overall I really enjoyed it I think the the main thing looking back that it was hard to do another time jump here a six-year one we didn't think we had another one of this size coming. So a lot of the actors we just met are already gone. Like talk about like really just kind of yada yada your like awkward puberty years. And the showrunner said like all these characters are now supposed to be between like 18 and 21, which just coincidentally makes them, you know, old enough to consent and whatnot and everything like that. So I think it was a little rough having to jump that quick while a lot of the adults kind of didn't really change. Like, dude, shout out Damon. Like he's looked the same for this entire run of the show. Everyone else has gotten older, been recast. Dude looks exactly the same. Just can't rock a hoodie. Overall, I enjoyed it. Uh, definitely more so on my second and third watch than on my initial watch, but it was also a long day of football. So first watch is always a little bit misleading. Well, the first watch, the night's watch, who knows? But what I will say is, Dude, this episode, you really start to think like, man, the game, if if you didn't think the game started, you're in the game now, right? And you start to see it at a different angle. I, what I liked about this one was it it's not just the Iron Throne, right? It's also now Driftwood and it's all intertwined. And I, I just, I really liked how the ball's starting to move here and the game is like, we're deep in it, man, whether, whether you know it or not. And so I thought they did a great job this episode. And, you know, I just got to say, man, Patty Constantine, like shout out to to you, dude, as an actor and, and Viserys here. I mean, I thought this was so cool, like how they did this. It was, it was fantastic work on his behalf. 
I'm a big fan of this episode, man. Yes, the time jump was a little tough. It seemed very quick, but this one really worked for me. And uh, overall, I thought this this was a great episode. And it's kind of like, okay, we're stacking good episodes on better episodes on better episodes on better episodes. It seems like we're kind of getting to that stretch here. And again, I, I, I'm really excited about what's to come. That's what she said. Now, this episode doesn't mess around, right? Right off the bat, we've jumped about six years into the future and Corliss Valerian has been gravely wounded. This brings the matter of succession back to the front burner. We know that Corliss wanted his grandson, Lucerus, to be the heir, but his brother, Vaymond, <laughs> well, he ain't having it, bro. He's not sure it's the right move. This drives everybody to head over to King's Landing, make their case to the throne, how did this opening work for you? I mean, I, on top of all that, we see that, you know, Renera's pregnant with Damon's kid and like a lot's happened here, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like the time jump, like you said, Renera and Damon have one on the way. They already have two sons of their own in this kind of, not yada yadas, but we saw in the sneak peek for next week, we heard this line about the sneak steak being gravely injured. So I think that took away maybe a little bit of the impact not really a big deal. It's just setting up the rest of the episode. I think a lot of the interesting parts here is how Rainey's plays it because she has a bunch of options here, none of them good. And you actually get the idea like later in the episode when she has a talk with Renera that she's going to go with herself until Viserys shows up and steps in. Like she's actually like, all right, now Vaymon is like too much. This, you know, Viserys is unfortunately not really our blood. Like, there's, with no other good option, she was going to probably go with herself. You kind of get this idea here, like, she's listening to, you know, Vayman do his thing or whatever, and, you know, deep down, I think she's kind of already made her mind up, so to speak. You know, this is a character we've heard a lot about, the queen that never was, and I think this episode is one of the first times she gets to really get put kind of front and center, and I definitely enjoyed that. Yeah, no, I thought that was great, too. You, you, you're spot on with that one. The thing with Vayman was kind of interesting here. It's like we kind of saw a little bit of foreshadowing way back when they were fighting the Crab Man, where he was kind of like questioning Damon, right, and wanted to just take control for himself. And you kind of see that same energy here out of him where he was like, you know, is he is he is it really just that Renera's kids are bastards or does he just want power? And you see that unfold throughout the episode. I got to say, dude, the other thing that was really cool about this shit was like Damon harvesting the dragon egg. Like I thought that was at first I'm like, what is this? Like, what is he doing? Um, I thought that was cool, man. I think to my knowledge, that's the first time we've ever seen anything like that. Yeah. I felt like kind of like some Melisandre type stuff, right? Like some blood magic type, like when that's happening, like it reminded me, like only I can think of was a little bit, I think it like the Lord of the, the Rings doing like, that's how they birthed the, the orc guy or whatever. Like they like pop these, like, I'm like, is he birthing a demon or something? That's what made me think of. Yeah you know, the red lady. So, but yeah, I thought that was really cool. The idea that they, you know, they harvested these three dragon eggs and uh, that's something I think we can even talk about in predictions, but obviously I think, you know, again, they call it the dance of dragons for a reason. So we didn't get a lot of them this episode. We'll talk about that too, but they, I like, again, definitely the first time we've seen like a raw harvesting of a dragon egg and uh, yeah, pretty, pretty, Freaky? I mean, it probably took some trial and error to figure out how to harvest those, I'm guessing. I have a lot of questions. I mean, is there a GPS tracker in there? How do you know? Lots of things. We have questions, but we're not taking any questions right now, okay? We're not taking questions. We're moving on. Just like the rest of the cast, we're back in King's Landing, baby. And boy, it's sweet to be home. We quickly find out that Viserys is still alive, but barely functional. I mean, it's bad. And in his stead, Otto and Alicunt, I'm sorry, Alicent, are basically running the kingdom. Alicent has leaned heavily into her faith, but she seems to be struggling with raising her sons. We'll get to that in just a bit. But I think we need to start with Viserys here, right? Shout out Patty Considine, as well as all the hair and makeup people and the visual effects squad. I mean, whoa. Viserys looks so bad here <laughs> that... I'm betting that Patty Considine's friends were calling him up to ask him if he's okay after this, all this episode, like, dude, are you alive? Because bro, this was gross, but also like, oh my God, it's like a dying, like creature. Like this was weird, man, but really, really, really good. I mean, just painted the picture. 
to a T. I mean, even down to his nails were like, like black. Like, I mean, this was just like, dude was just oozing with death, like just oozing death. Yeah, this is definitely one of the spots that it pays to watch. The, there's two inside the episode joints on HBO Max, or I'm assuming on demand if you have like a basic cable or, you know, whatever. You still get it through the through the box or what have you. They definitely showed uh, how, like in that, like they made his hair thinner throughout the season. And then here in the final one, like it's this kind of mass thing. Like somebody had to individually thread each one of those like white wispy hairs. You know how long that takes and how just meticulous that kind of work is. So shout out to all of those people that it looks great. And it added a lot to the character because it made you realize like just how frail this guy is. Right. And I think he really stones up this episode and does the very best that he possibly can. But he's so weak, right? And this is in contrast to the book where he kind of gets like old and fat. Here, he, they, they, they go the other way. They make him frail. They talked about how they used a body double too and kind of blended some of the stuff digitally. Uh, if you're interested at all in that kind of thing, very worth checking out uh, the way they did some of this stuff. Very cool. And I mean, look, like just frightening, man. Like I guarantee you there's somewhere out there, there's Dennis posting stuff of this to Facebook. Like, yo, when's the last time you saw your guy? Definitely Crypt Keeper, 100% all the way. Mills, we kind of realize here that on one hand, it's like, okay, maybe he's legitimately in a lot of pain. And that is why Allison and Otto keep just essentially feeding him and dosing him with milk of the poppy here to keep him out of the way. But on the other hand, maybe they just want to keep him alive so that they can remain in power and set up, set up all the pieces on the chessboard to benefit the transition, right? So interesting dynamic. I mean, they're they're for all intents and purposes running the kingdom right now. Viserys even says that to Rhaenyra and Damon when they show up. So I, I definitely think you're you're on the right track there. You get the idea that he had like his you know milk of the poppy every morning, night, whatever. And you saw Allison also tell Rhaenyra like, oh, you don't know how much pain he's in. And you get the idea like. When you see him do the walk to the throne later, dude is definitely in pain. There's no doubt about that. Like he is actually one of those dudes that really needs the pain meds. He's not just like seeking them or what have you. There is a chance that they've been over medicating him, right? Like it, maybe they weren't necessarily trying to put him on the edge of death, but they definitely were like, yeah, dude, you don't need to like come to the throne room anymore. Just lay in bed, right? Like it's cool. Just drink a little, your opium milk or heroin milk or whatever it actually is. Could it be that they actually invented fight milk though, Mills? I mean, it's like, could it, could, could this be where fight milk started in Westeros? I mean, other body, I mean, the King's Guard is kind of like bodyguards, right? So if maybe someone on the King's Guard invented it, it could be by bodyguards for bodyguards and they definitely have crows. So I can believe that, you know, makes you fight like a crow. Fight milk. The first alcoholic dairy based protein drink for bodyguards. Bye, bodyguard! I drink it every morning so I can fight like a crowd. There is there is definitely some crossover appeal here. Maybe Viserys is tuning in to It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I'm not sure, but if you haven't, you probably should because then you'll A, get that joke, and B, you'll be very entertained for quite a while. And uh, it's, again, I love all these shows like this. Like this, you could wish you watched the episode for the first time again, right, without knowing what happens. That's always the mark of a good time. Absolutely. And we do see uh, here that you know, Viserys, I think, seemed generally happy that Rhaenyra showed up and that, you know, I, she introduces a new grand, you know, grandchildren um, and even Damon rounds the corner here. I thought this was interesting that they that, you know, she introduced him to Aegon, you know, because going into this, you kind of always think like, OK, well, we know Aegon is going to become king, right? Then it's like, OK, well, Viserys already has Aegon, you know, so that's who it's going to be. But you're like, I don't know. You know, so this adds another layer of dynamic here. I was a big fan of it. I thought it was pretty cool. Definitely a little bit of pandering towards the uh, grandfather here. Like, Aegon's one of those names, right? Like, it's like Aegon the Conqueror. Like, you don't just do that. It'd be like, you know, Elvis naming his kid Elvis Jr. or something of that. Like, it's like a huge, like, you know, LeBron or Michael Jordan naming their kids. Like, like it's a big burden to bear, kind of. On the other hand, like, the Targaryens definitely do need to expand their available list of names. Like, it seems like they have about, like, six names and, like, seven different sounds that they cycle through. 
should expand the the menu a bit there. It's more of like a tire, like it's a bad casino buffet right now. At least have a good casino buffet. In the in the books, this is definitely more or less how things go down to a certain extent as far as the names. So then you have like Aegon, who is Alicent's son, is referred to as Aegon the the eldest. And then here you have the young Aegon, who's Rhaenyra's son, referred to as Aegon the Young. So in the books, like that's how they differentiate between the two. There definitely are two Aegons. No Aegos, though. So no one has conquered the waffle market yet in the Westeros world. But I think uh, the Tyrells at some point, someone's got maple syrup. They, they got the syrup, but I don't know that they've invented the waffle yet. Maybe they're waiting on hot pie for that. Tune in and we'll find out. Much like Trick Daddy. Jamie G loved kids, but not unconditionally. For instance, if they start getting rapey per se, then I've got no love for them at all. And Mills, unfortunately, we see that the older Aegon still sucks and may in fact be worse, like a pretty shitty person. The servant girl approaches Allison and tells her that Aegon had relations with her despite her unwillingness. Allison initially acts sympathetic, but we quickly realize that she's just manipulating the girl. Eventually, she sends her on her way with some gold and some tea just to be safe. You got to drink the tea. You don't want any little baby Aegon swimming around. And Mills, what do you think? Was that some moon tea or regular tea or could it have been some poison? I don't think it was regular tea. It wasn't Mr. Tea. So I think you're left with moon tea or poison. I'm going to go with Moon Tea because I don't think Allison is there yet because the gangster thing to do would be to just poison her and then take the dough back. Like, then you take the gold back, too. I don't think she's quite there yet, but I feel like next episode, El- next episode, Allison will be ready to take that next step. But yeah, uh, Aegon kind of sucks, dude. Like, he kind of, like, knows that he sucks. And he's like, you know, the whole thing where he gives like, oh, well, I'm never going to be able to live up to what you and dad want. And it basically seems like, like dude, don't be, like, openly rapey. Like, the, they're not setting the bar, like, this is like, at South Park had, like, the James Cameron bar, like, on the bottom of the ocean. Dude. It's real low, dude. Just don't be a drunk, rapey asshole. I mean, that's, like, the least you can ask for. And, yeah, you're starting to Yeah, really fuck the DRA, just... dude. Fuck the DRA, dude. The drunk, yeah, rapey dude. assholes can fucking get it. They, yeah, they can, they can all go to, you know, all the way to the, all seven hells, for all I care. And... I don't know, man. I'm starting to get some serious Joffrey vibes here from Aegon and Aemon. They both actually seem like assholes as this episode unravels. Aemon, though, he actually seems like a pretty good fighter. And, you know, we're we're still led to believe that he's a dragon rider. And while Aegon is just, you know, kind of a little shit here. uh, In other words, Aegon is probably more Joffrey-ish than Aemon, but both kind of approaching that level. Aemon almost seems more like Ramsey-ish. And uh, Aegon seems more Joffrey-ish, I guess, if I had to choose. Yeah, because Ramsay was more competent, right? Like, Joffrey basically yes. was just an asshole, like, in a vindictive, sadistic asshole through and through. He really didn't have any, like, he just wanted power for the sake of power. He had no, like, he just loved, like, seeing Ned Stark head chopped off and, like, making girls, you know, shoot each other with the cross. Like, he was just a fucked up dude. And you get the idea that it's kind of Aegon. Like, he doesn't care. Like, he's just casually raping people already yet even call it 21 years old there's no acceptable age for rapey but you get the idea this wasn't the first time he's done that and then meanwhile Eamon is definitely like pirate captain like he like reminds you a little bit of Ramsey's bolt before we knew who he was with the flaying and everything where like you know he, he was very adaptable and smart and he could get under your skin and you see later in the episode Eamon does exactly that with the speech that perfectly rides a line between like Oh, uh, that's not at all what I was saying in being, yeah, people know exactly what you're saying without saying it. So dude is smart. Dude is now skilled with multiple weapons and got the biggest dragon in the land and a cool ass eye patch. All the signs are adding up, man. Like it, Eamon is like the, the fuck around and find out, dude. So uh, yeah, we'll talk you know later on, maybe in predictions about who he might go up against. While we're making comparisons, dude, I've been calling it for, you know, an episode or two now, but Allison is really moving closer to that Cersei Lannister um, atmosphere at this point. And I think, you know, every every episode we kind of get closer uh, where you see kind of more and more Cersei here. 
she does the fake sympathy thing pretty good, dude. And then like smoothly transitions into victim shaming. Um, they're a skill set only Cersei Lannister could possess. Well, it depends on how much wine you're drinking. It's like those people who at the bar who get better at darts, depending on how much they drink and what they're drinking, how fast. So it, it's definitely a narrow band. But yeah, you get the idea. That's why I said, like, you know, I don't think this was uh, Aegon's first rodeo. Because the way Allison kind of like she figures it out real quick because it, like she's just told the prince or whatever. And as soon as the girl comes running, uh, Diana, I think, is, of course, spelled like real weird, like D-Y-A-N-A. Thanks, George. The show is really working hard here, I think, to make both sides somewhat sympathetic so we have someone to root for. That's one thing. And I don't really even think this is a book spoiler, but when the Dance of Dragons goes down, part of the problem I shouldn't say the problem, but the idea that the book is a historical text means that, like, you're not really rooting for anybody. Like, all of these people kind of suck. Like, they're all kind of, like, self-aggrandized, like, doing this for their own sake of glory and power and everything. So I think it's important that the show has, A, dialed that back a little bit, and then, B, given us reasons to root for both sides, at, at least on some level. And we'll talk about that at the end of the episode, how what Viserys' final words to Allison are kind of misinterpreted as and how that is what the show is going to use to kick off the whole damn thing. Yeah, no, I, I like it, man. And I guess we got to mention it here. We we do see Eamon with working in his fighting skills and he's up against our old friend, Sir Kristen Cole. And he wins. Uh, kind of a cool scene there. As you, He looked badass, dude. He did. And and you, it, it's kind of neat to see kind of, you see the excitement of, um, you know, Renera's kids coming back home and, and you know, seeing the old stuff and everything. And you kind of see Amond has turned into something different than what he was when they were kids. So found that to be a um, an interesting scene. Yeah. Oh, because he gets the line because Amon gets the line after they kind of come in or everything. He's like, nephews, have you come to train? Like, he's like, I've been putting in the work. Like, have you all been putting in the work? Kind of like just a nice little subtle flex right there. Oh, he's he's the king of the set of the subtle flex and maybe the not so subtle flex. It is time for everybody to make their case. They head to the throne room where Otto is sitting on the throne as hand acting for the king. It looks at, like things are going to go Vaymon's way here when Viserys unexpectedly shows up. Let's talk about the initial arguments made by Vaymond and what we thought about Viserys' appearance here before we get to the end of the scene. Shout out Patty Considine again. Like, this is his Emmy episode, most definitely, that he is going to submit. But this walk he does with the dragon cane in the slow, and then kind of how he struggles and he drops the crown going up the stairs. And then he, Damon's the one who helps him up and puts the crown on his head. I half expected Damon to kneel. But I also half expected, I was like, tell me walking up these stairs, he's going to fall on those swords, and that's how he dies. Like, I've read the book. I know that didn't happen, but. Like in the but there is a chance given the way that like they could make that change. I don't know. I got I was just so randomly like, what if like he's gonna do the thing like right as he like says what he's about to say and like oh this was already decided and yada 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 like he just like falls on the swords. I was definitely worried for a minute. That would have been really cool. I mean he he I don't know he if would have been really I mean, cool, but it would have been surprising. It would have been surprising. I I mean I I would have liked it. I mean he always had the weird thing where he sat on the throne and like cut him and shit. So maybe that was the final good fitting finish there but dude i thought he looked awesome i love the cane bro that sound with the dragon on the top put his mask dude that half gold mask was like dynamite if you guys know where i can find one hit us up drunk on dragons let us know because your boy jamie g wants to rock that i would rock it for, for for this podcast and beyond very cool look I'm definitely curious as to the and beyond where you would wear it, but I guess you'd have to call it like the Phantom of the Dragon, right? Like, is Phantom of the Targaryen probably doesn't sound right. Like, Phantom of the Viserys? Uh, and a Phantom of the Dragon or Phantom of the Drunk are probably the, the, the top two. And uh, he was pretty, you know, he made a whole point that, to be sober this episode. Like, before he walked in, though, this shit was in the bag, right? Like, you already knew the High Towers were going to go in favor of Vaemon which was probably going to cause Rainey's to come out and then pitch her own case, which would have maybe even put Renera in third place. So this was a big deal. And it's kind of the, 
at least the first part, there's a two part culmination here. There's some edging going on because we had seen the scene where Ronero went to Viserys's chamber at night to talk to him about the whole prince that was promised prophecy in the Song of Ice and Fire thing. And he kind of doesn't make it, but she begs him to stick up for her. And that's why I think that he finds the strength to go to the throne room. And the show did a great job of showing how frail he was. Viserys really sacked up here. Like you get the idea of just like how Herculean of an effort it was for him to make it out of bed, to not take that milk of the poppy, to walk up that fucking those stairs and sit on that throne. And I love the bit with Otto where Otto's like, I am speaking for the king. And then he just rolls in. He's like, I think I'll be sitting the throne today. Like, fuck yeah, Patty Considine, dude. Fuck yeah. Love that, dude. I loved it. And, you know, this was interesting because we see in the scene before that Renera making a last ditch effort here with Rainey's to try to, to try to make an offer to get an alliance here going into this because she knows things aren't looking good for her based on how she entered, you know, the, the, the King's Landing. And you didn't get the feeling that Reyna was going to take her up on that because I think she still blames her for her son's death. And I, you know, you just got the feeling that she was not going to move on that. But when Viserys comes in that room and sits, it's like she makes a decision to to take her up on that. So I thought that was a really cool development too. Hondo over Hondo. We see Viserys notes that this issue has already been decided. He can't even imagine. He doesn't understand why we're voting on something that's already been decided. It's a waste of time, people. Viserys is the heir, just as Corliss had wished. He also grants his approval of the marriages between Renera's son and Renera's sons and Reyna's granddaughters. At this point, Vayman figures he has nothing to lose, bro. Her children are bastards! And she is a whore. Viserys finds the strength to get to his feet as he pulls out his dagger and says he'll have his tongue for that. Ha! Huh, but no need. Oh, no, 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 no. We'll have your tongue for that. He can keep his tongue. Damon's got this. He whips out Dark Sister, cleaves Vayman's head straight in half. I mean, this was almost like a, he split Robin's arrow in twine. I mean, this thing was like, shoo, I mean, just cut to the core. Wow, dude. I'm just, I just want a steak knife that can cut that good. I mean, jeez. I mean, it's not quite Robin Hood and then in tights maybe, but it, God, it reminded me of, Back in the day, uh, when the whole like Britney Spears kind of went crazy thing a while ago, South Park did an episode, which is actually it, it has some serious things to say about celebrity and everything. But the kind of half the running gag is like Britney Spears tries to commit suicide and she shoots herself in the head with a shotgun and she kind of like blows the top of her head off, but she's just got like this bottom of her South Park head and the tongue left, and they like, put a hat on her or whatever. Like here, you kind of see the dude like. Damon slices him in such a way that he leaves the tongue, right? Like, you have to kind of believe yeah. they did that deliberately. Again, this is one of those things, if you watch the behind the scenes of the episode, they talked a bit about how they did this. Definitely a combination of makeup, practical, visual, special effects. Like, everyone was in on this to make it happen. But fuck, man, that looked great and, like, incredibly gory, like, all simultaneously. And it was a true, like, Game of Thrones, like, WTF moment, right? Like, damn. Double damn, even. You knew something was going to happen there, but I almost forgot about Damon just for a second because they did such a great job showing Viserys anger. And motherfuckers act like they forgot about Damon. Yo, you can't forget about Damon, dude. You can't. You can't. That's exactly right. Very, very cool scene. Give Viserys credit here. He's literally given it his all. He elects to forego his usual morning milk of the poppy in order to keep his wits about him. That's because Viserys is an avid watcher of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, obviously. And he knows how to squash a beef. You just have to have everybody over for dinner and things will work themselves out. Let's start to unpack the scene, Mills. What do you have for us? Well, in a kind of another crossover scenario, 
with Game of Thrones and Always Sunny, if having them over to dinner doesn't work, you just steal the place up, light it on fire. We saw Daenerys beat the uh, the Kalasars of like the Dothraki just by yep, stealing them in the building, just burn it down. Got that. So definitely some parallels here. Uh, on a serious note, definitely, you know, shout out fucking Patty Considine. Like the speech he gives, it's so heartfelt, but the idea that he takes off his mask and then this is VFX doing their work, his fucking eye hole and everything is just unsettling in his teeth. And you get the idea, like he knows, like this is kind of like his last reservoir of strength, right? Like he's pouring his all into this, like this has to work. And I think at least I'm, we can argue about whether everybody necessarily means the speeches that they give or whatever, or they're just trying to, like, they all kind of love and respect him enough to give him what he wants. I think it's probably a little bit of both, but shout out Viserys and Patty Johnson. I like, dude, goes the whole nine for this one. Like, there is, like, you know, it's like Bobby Boucher at the end of the game. Like, you can't hold anything back. Out of all the times, even early on when he was healthy and capable, he had never done anything more heartfelt or more needed than this. And you can feel it. Like, I found this scene to be fantastic, but also fascinating because you knew that there was so much tension in this room that while everything was sunny in Philadelphia, it was about to thunderstorm and rain real quick and shout out to Renera, dude she acts first here her toast to allison was was really nice and you know she then allison then returns a favor we've spent a lot of stuff about viserys and you know i think all the speeches are really good but we probably need to do the the trick daddy thing and like i'm not saying kids ruin everything but it, they don't help here man like right like it's just Bad overall, starting with we see like some of the kids arrange for Amon to be served a roasted pig. That's a callback to the pink dread prank when he didn't have a dragon back in episode six. And they, you know, put the, the pig with the saddle out there. And uh, then Amon, uh, he gives a speech and fisticuffs happen. And uh, it's some shit, dude. Like, this is like, do you think that if the kids hadn't gone off on each other, there's a chance that there might actually have been a piece? Like, did the kids, like, ultimately, were they the tipping point? You know, I think so, man. I think for a second there, Allison was like, you know what? I feel my husband. Because deep down inside, I still think she's, yeah, she's been corrupted by power and her father and everything else. But deep down inside, I still think she loves her husband. And I still think she has a special place for Renera especially when things got like kind of real there. Now, in reality, they could have maybe went their separate ways politically, but the kids push this thing to a whole new realm of of tension, dude. Like it's it's just it's just the way it is, right? And because of what's happened with the illegitimates and this and that, it's like shit, dude, this thing is this thing is ugly. Yes, it's both Bubba Sparks and Tupac and that it's just the way it is and it's ugly. Amon like he's kind of just a bad ass right like and i think the show is going out of their way to show that both what we saw in the training scene and then here like kind of the way he faces off with damon like maybe save it for predictions but you feel like i don't know like he feels like young damon but with an eye patch so that makes him like 25 percent more badass so i feel like they're destined to face off especially since uh damon is probably the most experienced dragon rider while Eamon rides the biggest and theor theoretically the most badass dragon man there's some shit coming down the pike here right man like we're starting to, to kind of talk about it like this and just kind of any thoughts on the kids overall because it seemed at first like most of them were going to go along with it but the show again kind of doing the both sides thing like sure Eamon's a dick but the kids still sent him the pig like that didn't need to happen really right like so I think it goes to it's a deliberate act i feel to make this again kind of not want to pick sides yet yeah and and look it's also setting up like hey these are the kids now they're not these innocent little kids who aren't really sure and don't really want to deal with the 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 scale of who they are what they were born into well now here we are you know six years in the in the future and they're ready 
you know, we even see kind of uh, Jace, you know, early on practicing religiously his high, high Valerian because he's ready to be king. Like we see these kids starting to kind of take form of like, okay, what, is, what am I going to be and how do I get there? And I think this, this scene kind of, it just kind of shines a light on it, right? Like we're going to see these guys fight. It's not going to be Viserys fighting somebody. It's probably not even going to be Rhaenyra. It might even be, be Damon. I think we're going to see these kids fighting each other. And you know, not to get into predictions here, but I, I think it's a, I think it's a game changing dynamic for the show. It really is. Yeah, especially because you know, I think we're obviously we're heading into the penultimate episode, then this season finale, with the main focus probably being a bunch of actors we just met for the first time in these roles. Definitely a bull move, Cotton. I, we'll see if it pays off here, but I think so far the results are promising to say the least. Yeah. And Mills, we finish out the episode with the with the least surprising death in the history of Game of Thrones. I mean, I, we've all been waiting this for this one for 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 weeks, but you know, of course, it's more complex than that. Earlier in this episode, okay, we see Renera attempt to talk to Viserys about the family secret, the Song of Ice and Fire, but he was unable to communicate with her at the time. And at the end of the episode here, you know, we, we, we see he mistakes Allison for Renera and talks to her about Aegon, the prince that was promised. He's talking to her about Aegon the Conqueror, but she thinks that he's talking about their son, Aegon the Rapist. This will remove any kind of like doubts Allison might have had about trying to put Aegon on the throne instead of Renera. You got to believe she's all in now, right? I mean, dude, I was watching the scene like so angry, like, why? You know, like, this sucks. What's going to, you know, just when you think everything's kind of going the way you want, which is great because the show did something, had me rooting for something. And so that was a real win. Yeah, it's so fucked up on a couple of levels because, yes, you're absolutely right. Like, it's so heartbreaking that, in, yeah, maybe you get the idea that Alice had kind of like she hears what she wanted to hear, right? You know how that is, like the selective hearing. She just hears the words Aegon and, you know, promised and must, and she just automatically assumes that's her son or whatever. But on the other hand, this is the Targaryen family secret. She doesn't know anything about this. So there's no reason for her to think otherwise. Again, the show plays it perfectly, right? To give justification to both sides here, not necessarily on Team Black or Team Green. You'd think, you know, Targaryen would be Team Red, but it is what it is. You know, we're not doing a strictly checkers thing here. I have to say that I think it was kind of sweet, though, that I got the idea that Viserys died because he, like, he thought he accomplished what he needed to accomplish, right? He had the whole thing at the dinner, and then he thinks he tells Renero what she needs to hear about the prince that was promised. And then in my read, he kind of had like that final, remember, he wanted to be like a dreamer and see things like, I feel like he had that final dream where he saw something and then cut because that was it. Like, that was kind of his reward as he got that final look. But what did he see or whatever? I definitely think it's both a great ending for Patty Considine, for Viserys as a character, and also something that very expertly set us up to under, at least be sympathetic to you know, Allison or Renera, depending on, you know, which side you're on, or even if you're just trying to middle it out. Yes, 100% agree with that. I think that's really astute kind of point there. I thought this was one of the better, like, deaths to watch kind of throughout, like, all of Game of Thrones. Um, it didn't come as a surprise, but it was kind of like, you felt good about it, like you said. Like, he, he did what he had to do. He knew he had to do it as soon as his daughter came. He knew he had to do it. And he kind of set out and he did everything in his power and he was at peace. And for me, that made me really happy. I mean, I think that's all anyone wants when they die is to be at peace and feel like you accomplished what you needed to accomplish. And I'm happy for Viserys to do that. I just, I hate that it was a small minor detail there where he, where he confused, um, you know, Alicent with, with Renera. But we talked about it for weeks. Like, will we see him die on camera? Will he be killed? Will he die of natural causes? And we finally got our answer here. And I was, like I said, I can't think of a better death scene, really, in terms of, like, everything was in harmony and, and peaceful. It was kind of a sweet scene, honestly. Definitely one of the 
you know, best or cleanest deaths that Game of Thrones has ever given anybody. So, and I, you think he deserved it, right? Like, he this was someone who never really had like great ambitions other than to just kind of just be like a good king. He didn't even want to be like a great king necessarily. He just wanted to be like just a solid, regular old king. In you know, maybe he was misguided at times or not assertive enough, but at the end, like he really sacked up here, I think. And you know, despite being massively ill really did his absolute very best to do what he thought was right and what in retrospect you know appears to probably actually have also been actually right so he's correct in both senses which is important yeah and you know shout out to Viserys he's he ruled in peace for a long time um so you know I think you could deem him as successful uh, but he wasn't, you know, he, he, history maybe not be as kind to him, but I, I think he's uh was a fine king for all intents and purposes. And that about covers the major players here. Anything else or anyone else that you'd like to talk about before we move on, Magnum Mills? One little thing we didn't probably touch on is that we did see like uh, Lady Allison's servant have that scene with uh, Damon's ex-mistress there the bronze bitch in like got something so that lent a little credence to maybe the poisoning thing or whatever so there's a little bit going on with that that we probably didn't touch on definitely enjoyed it and i want to say one final time shout out patty considine the show is definitely going to be different going forward without you at the center you were the guy who kind of held us together through all of the time jumps and everything like that thought you were pretty great man so thank you 100 percent. and mills with that said we now have to ask the most important question was there enough drinking and was there enough dragons in this episode titled the lord of the tides no but i'm gonna let him do like a little bit of layaway thing we had some drinking but it was not really that great of quality drinking at the dinner and whatnot. Zero dragons, but dragon eggs. I'm guessing that this is a, a good old uh, save the budget and whatnot for the penultimate episode and possibly the season finale. So I'm going to give it an incomplete here. I'm not, I'm not crazy about it, but I'm willing to grade it in the future once I know the, the end outcome here. Yeah, I mean, you, you saw a nice couple of toasts at that dinner. Um, you know, I thought it was interesting where they they highlighted Aegon kind of slamming his wine. Like, he's he's definitely a drinker. Um, but, you know, I enjoyed that little bit of, like, peaceful family drinking, which then turned to somebody had too much to drink, so now the family's fighting. Uh, you know, those, those happen to the best of the families out there. So uh, that was kind of interesting. I didn't like that. I didn't get a single solitary dragon, but dude, how cool was it to see them hatching like and harvesting, not hatching, but harvesting a dragon egg. I thought that was awesome. So I'm willing to give it a pass there. I've got high hopes for the next two though. So tune in to the next episode of drunk on dragons. And we'll let you know just how happy we are with the level of drinking and dragons. With that said, it is time to hand out the awards for our favorite parts of the Lord of the Tides, starting with that hot dialogue, that hot D, which is our favorite quote or bit of dialogue from the episode. Mills, I'm Jamie G, and G sometimes stands for gentlemen, so I will go first here. This one was, there was some good quotes here, and obviously... I just, I can't not go with Viserys' quote at dinner. Like, I cannot, like, not go with it. It was amazing, right? Let us no longer hold ill feelings in our hearts. The crown cannot stand strong if the house of the dragon remains divided. But set aside your grievances. If not for the sake of the crown, then for the sake of this old man, who loves you all so dearly. That was my favorite quote by far. Yeah, you are not wrong there. That is, again, Patty Considine doing work. Enjoyed it very much. I am going to stay at the dinner for my favorite quote and go with Eamon 
where he does the you know textbook passive aggressive is hard as it gets right to the bone when he says final tribute to the health of my nephews jace luke and joffrey each of them handsome wise Strong. Amen. Come. Let us drain our cups to these three strong boys. I dare you to say that again. Why? It was only a compliment. Do you not think yourself strong? <laughs> Why would you say such a thing to these people? I was merely expressing how proud I am of my family. But it seems my nephews aren't quite as proud of theirs. Extremely passive aggressive on the next, like, next level passive aggressive and boy oh boy did he nail it that brings us to the hot fire of the week sponsored by dylan this is our favorite moment or scene from the lord of the tides mills you're up first here i have to go with the dinner i, I think the birth of the dragon egg was cool i also enjoyed the scene between uh Rhaenys and renera in the godswood but man the, the dinner scene classic game of thrones as much as i would like to go with uh damon slicing Vayman's head you know clean in half that was more of just that was such a quick moment i i enjoyed it all but i really think that the dinner scene overall if you're going to give it to like a scene and something that is like this is like the shaping of a country and how many people will live and die based on what happened at this one dinner. Like it's, it's like the most consequential, horrible family Thanksgiving dinner you've ever been to when everyone starts drinking early because your team plays at noon. I mean, it's right up there with the best of the dinner of schmucks. I got to go with the same thing, dude. I cannot not give it to that. I mean, we're, we're, we're not getting caught up doing the repeater here, although that does happen from time to time. I'm just, I can't not give it that. It was clear cut, runaway scene, um, you know, by far. This is the House of the Dragon, but everybody is obviously still playing the Game of Thrones. Now we have to decide on our player of the week, the episode MVP for the Lord of the Ties. And Mills, I just, I don't know, man. Maybe I'm biased here, but I have to give it to Viserys, dude. Like he, he, he was on his, like he was basically useless and dead and a rotting corpse of flesh in his bed just taking his milk of the poppy and he gets his ass up he gets a plan he shows up to court he has the dinner he gives a speech of a lifetime he sets the action on the course that he wants to see that he knows in his heart is right and he dies at peace how can he not be mvp here, 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 here. I, I second your motion. I think he's a clear, unanimous MVP for the episode. Dude sacks up to the maximum of his ability. Like, you can tell he doesn't have much strength left, and he marshals all of it here to do everything he can to, like, set things right. You know what I mean? To, like, correct whatever he feels his inequities were, where he was wrong. And he sticks by his initial rulings for the most part, as far as Renera and Luceris. It's only the misinterpreted words that Al said at the end that maybe will do in his legacy. But yeah, dude, 100% unanimous MVP, Viserys. Rest in peace, Viserys. While we maybe didn't officially attend the Citadel, but one time I did accidentally sit on a Dell laptop. That should be enough to qualify us to give a grade here for this episode, episode eight, titled The Lord of the Tides. And for the record, we grade each episode of House of the Dragon on a scale of one to ten dragons. Look, dude, I don't know. Maybe it's just because like the peaks have been building and we're finally starting to get to some of the exciting stuff here. And you see like the, 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 the chessboard has been set, the pieces have been moved and you can't wait to see what's next. Uh, end of the day, dude, I'm giving this thing 9.3 dragons. I really like this episode. I understand there was, it was tough to do another jump, but dude, 
it's getting really good. And I'm so excited about these final two episodes, you know, in season one here. I like where you're living at. I'm going to stay basically right where I've been in the last couple episodes. I'm going to go 9.2 Dragons. I definitely enjoyed it, but I, I think this is still, again, more set up, right? Like, he's, anytime you're doing a time jump, introducing new actors, playing characters we've already met, that's some work. So hopefully, I think we're finally at the point now where, like, all right, like, you know, if you're going to put it in PMD terms, like, you know what I mean? Like, now you put in work, and now it's, like, open for business. Like, this is the time. Stuff's going to start happening. Very excited about it. 9.2 Dragons. Good stuff for me. And that brings us to one of our favorite parts of Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon. It's just speculating, bullshitting, theorizing, all that fun stuff. Just for the record, we have both watched the sneak peek for episode nine. That's the little teaser where you get the, you know, one minute preview or so of the little trailer of what's coming on the next episode. If you want to remain totally pure, you don't want to be spoiled on that at all, go ahead and check out now. Thank you for watching. If you are, stick right here with us for a little bit of that speculation corner type of fun stuff. In Jamie G, let me just, uh, let's start with the the fun stuff, right? Like, uh, are we going to lose one of the kids next episode? Oh, man. You know what? I'm saying yes. I'm saying yes. One of these kids is going to die. Well, because something has to really like kick it off, right? Like, what do you think the, if you had to take a guess, what is the inciting event? Like, you know, tempers are going to be high after this, but like, it, it's all kind of like politics until like something happens. Like, what is the spark that lights off that powder keg? You know, it could be something with, with Aegon the rapist doing something wrong here and, and getting it, you know, but I, I think it's going to be Amond doing something. Or, you know what? If it's not Amond, I think it may be Damon doing something to one of to, to one of his nephews uh, to set the course of action here. Oh, I like it. I could definitely see, like, both of those guys wanting to escalate things. So they do a little bit of trickery, maybe, to accelerate the timeline, so to speak, because they're just you know they're kind of ready for this right like they they're down for the highlander situation i mean when you have a sword and an eye patch you're kind of committed to the highlander thing especially if you're on a dragon so what do you think that otto and allison's next moves are right like you get the idea coming out of this that allison is convinced now that viserys's final words were to say that aegon should be the king so that's what she's gonna say like well otto just immediately buy that Viserys actually said that or will he think Allison's kind of playing the part even if he thinks she's playing the part that's going to make him happy so either way I think he's probably going to say this is brilliant right so that's what he wanted anyway so even if it is kind of like again I think that's the show building sympathy but they kind of worked it that way so they have that nice little out that like Allison can happily believe what was the ideal situation for her because Otto was you get the feeling, right? He was kind of enjoying like sitting on that throne. Oh my god, yeah. Like he loved the power, he loved what came with it. Yes. And he knows that if it goes to Aegon, he's essentially sitting on that throne for the rest of his life. And <laughs> that's makes him a very happy person. All right. Well, I asked if a kid would die. How about this? Do we see a dragon die next episode? Like, does the combat begin already? Like, does the episode maybe end with a dragon taking an L? I'm going to say no, just because we haven't we haven't saw enough dragons yet to actually, you know, we had one scene where we started to care for a dragon. Like, we haven't seen him enough to really, like, be like, oh, one died, now I'm upset. Remember when we were so afraid of, uh, you know in game of thrones of one of the dragons getting getting shot with one of those arrows like dude i was like on pins and needles watching we're not there yet with this so i i'm gonna say no we're, we're not gonna see one die yet uh, i definitely think that somebody's probably gotta go though right like you, you have to feel like it's a death that kicks off what happens next uh, and speaking of what happens next like so what is Rainey's going to do? And do you think this the sea snake survives? Like, what's your thoughts on House of Valerian in the next episode? Like, where are they sitting at? 
Well, you know, obviously we know eventually this is going to be a thing where that house kind of dies, right? So I guess my thought here is he didn't die yet. And if it feels like if he was going to die, maybe they would have kind of let us know that. So I'm going to lean towards maybe he lives and that maybe sets, you know, maybe his, his living sets one of these other kids or, you know, Raina do something crazy, which then triggers kind of everything as the domino. So I'm going to say he's alive. Nice. I, I like that. And, uh, maybe one final one before we get out of here, unless you have anything for me, this is maybe more of a long-term thing, but do you think that it comes down to an Eamon versus Damon situation at some point? And if it does, who kills who? I mean, Eamon, Damon, dude, I like that. Just, I mean, that's like Ike and Mike here. I dude, it would be a cool, um, it would be a cool battle scene. I could see it happening, dude. I think Damon gets his uncle. We seen him take the L against Sir, uh, his nephew. We seen him take the L against Sir Kristen Cole in the uh, in the games, and uh, you know uh, the tournament. And we know Eamon doesn't give a damn about the tournament. I think maybe Damon gets him here, um, and that dragon ends up somewhere else, back into you know, the Targaryen, uh, you know, not, not the high tower infused Targaryen, but the pure Targaryen, if you will. At any point in the series, will somebody like, will two people be like sword fighting on the back of a dragon somehow? Like, <laughs> are we going to get some shit like that? You know, you see in the movie, like when someone like jumps on, like, I, can we go that far? Like, I'm, I'm not asking if it will look good, but will they go that far? Like we get some like, motherfuckers like trying to hijack a dragon like in flight like it's executive decision i want us to so bad but unfortunately i don't think we're gonna get it this season yeah i mean even like tom cruise and top gun never managed to jump from one plane to the other and then like hijack the plane that's a little bit much these predictions are incredibly fun and man we love talking about them and look people we know there's oh, by my math approximately four thousand six hundred and 37 podcasts covering house of the dragon we're grateful and honored that you managed to find ours we really appreciate it we got something cool going on here with our little drunk on dragons and if you enjoyed listening and or watching please come back next week but in the meantime if you could just like the video for pete's sake i mean what in the seven hells are you doing if you're not liking the video if you're watching you know, please rate this thing, uh, the podcast. If you're listening, rate it. If you're watching it, like it, whatever you're doing, do something with it. It would really help us out a lot. It will help other people find drunk on dragons where maybe they want to have a drink and talk about dragons. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, right? It's totally normal, totally cool thing to do. And it would be great because we love talking about the house of dragons and discussing it with everybody while having a drink. Did I miss anything else? Uh, not really. Eventually, like, I'm just curious about the movie that will be made of the fashion line called The House of the Dragon. I know it will be no House of the Gucci, but I'm curious as to who they will get to star in it. Maybe it could even be any money. Who knows? Uh, thank you very much for checking out Drunk on Dragons. Again, find us wherever you get your pods by searching for Drunk on Dragons. Same thing on social media. Find us at Drunk on Dragons. You can find our YouTube channel at JoeBlowFootballShow.com. We talk about a bunch of stuff there, not just football, but definitely football as implied by the name. We also do talk about other movies, other shows, got some exciting stuff coming up. You should check it out. It might be spooky season, but don't be scared. You should never be scared. Take that from Bone Crusher. And uh, thanks again for joining us for this episode of Drunk on Dragons. You don't have to drink, but if you're going to, you might as well drink on a dragon. And we'll see you next week to cover episode nine, the pen ultimate episode of season one. I can't even believe I'm saying that. We're already here. That episode is titled The Green Council. Man, oh man, with a name like that. Cannot wait to watch it. Thanks again for checking us out. Drunk on Dragons is an unofficial show. We are not in any way affiliated with House of the Dragon, Game of Thrones, George R.R. R. Martin, HBO, or Warner Brothers Television. The views expressed here are those of the hosts only and do not reflect the views of any other persons or entities. 
you can contact us at drunkondragonspod at gmail.com. Please remember to like and subscribe. We'll check you out again next time for more drinking and, of course, more dragons. <laughs>